Okay. One, two, three, four, five. Oh, are we ready? Mm -hmm. Okay. Hello, my name is Ariane Weiner. Today I have the pleasure of interviewing Dr. Harold Gilman. It is December 13th, 1998. We're in Palm Springs, California in the United States and the interview will be conducted in English. Could you please tell me your name? Uh, Harold uh, Gilman. Could you spell your last name for me? G-I-L-M-A-N. Is this the name that you were born with? Uh, yes, that's true. When were you born? On my August the 31st, 1917. How old are you today? I'm 81. Could you tell me the name of your mother? Uh, Rachel Winterman. Could you spell her last name for me? W-I-N-T-E-R-M-A-N. And the name of your father? Julius Gilman. G-I-L-M-A-N. Although at one time it was Gittleman. G-I-T-T-L-E-M-A-N. Do you know the names of your maternal grandparents? Um, uh, Winterman. And do you know their first names? Um, Leah. And the name of your paternal grandparents, do you know their names? Um, no, I don't remember. How many siblings do you have? Uh, I had two, uh, presently uh, one. Could you tell me the name of the oldest sibling? Um, Ida, who is now deceased, and Evelyn, uh, who presently lives in Denver. And Ida's last name? Raymond, R-A-Y-M-O-N. And how much older was she? She was about eight or nine years older than I. And your other sister? My other sister, Evelyn, is 18 months older than I am. And her last name? Uh, Salomon, S-A-L-I-M-A-N. Where were you born? In Denver, Denver, Colorado. Can you tell me what your father did for a living? Uh, he was a tailor. He had a you know, small tailor shop, cleaning and pressing and uh, alterations. Did he work for himself? Yes. What was the name of his business? It was uh, Crescent Cleaners and Dyers. Did your mother work? She helped him in the store. She used to do the pressing. Could you tell me about life as a young child? Um, it was a very, very stable uh, upbringing, uh, nothing uh, dramatic or exciting. Uh, went to school, uh, moved a time or two, and uh, n no great recollections of anything earth-shaking. What is one of your earliest childhood memories? And my mother taking me to uh, grade school, to kindergarten the first day. What was and I remember name? watching her walk away, and uh, I felt very forlorn. What was the name of your grade school? Mariah Mitchell. What was scary about going? Um, I had never in endured anything uh, such as that before. <laughs> but I have no, no recollection of anything immediately after that. Uh, I don't recall my reaction a day or two or even a week later. So evidently, I must have adjusted rapidly. Did your family ever take any trips? Um, in those days, our longest trip was to Colorado Springs, Colorado, if you're familiar with uh, that area. That's a 75-mile trip from Denver. And in those days, it was in a Model T Ford over a very bumpy, hilly road. And nowadays, it takes uh, an hour to go. It used to take four or five hours. What would you do there? Well, that, was, uh, that was our vacation for two or three days. We'd go to Manitou Springs, and uh, that was a great time. Tell me what you did there. 
in those days, uh, mostly it was play with the other kids. I was five or six uh, years old, and I remember looking at the Indians. They always used to have a lot of Indians on display, and uh, that was a great time. It wasn't a huge vacation, but it was an enjoyable vacation. What was Jewish life like for you? Jewish life? Mm -hmm. Uh, always went to uh, BMH synagogue, um, and I, I recall uh, the high holidays. Uh, the adults would be sitting upstairs, and all of us kids would be running around downstairs. And again, this is we we're very young, and I remember uh, on Yom Kippur, for instance, uh, we would have a lunch pack for us. <laughs> Did your parents come from the United States? Well, my parents <clears throat> came from uh, London. My father, my mother and father were married, and my father was ill in some way, and left my mother to come to California. He'd heard of California, and uh, he, he took the boat across the ocean. A train from uh, New York, but ran out of money in Denver and uh, was stranded. But he was befriended uh, by a Jewish lady and who got him a job. And her name? Um, Goodstein. And her son, incidentally, uh, became one of the wealthiest people uh, in America. Goodstein's from... Uh, from Casper, Wyoming, had huge oil interests. But anyway, she took him in her, uh, her home, and uh, he worked for a while and sent for my mother. Did you celebrate Shabbat in your home? Uh, yes, always. Every Friday night? Every Friday night. Can you tell me about a Shabbat? Um, my mother always used to say the blessings. And we had a very kosher home with one exception. My father loved bacon and my mother used to have a separate skillet and uh, uh, utensils and used to make him bacon and then hang it out on the back porch, all the utensils. But uh, she never touched anything like that. Do you remember your bar mitzvah? That was in, uh, I went to London when I was 13 with my mother, and uh, I was bar mitzvah over there. Why and that was, a, that was a very, very uh, short uh, service. It really wasn't uh, a service, actually. A formal bar mitzvah, I never had. Why were you bar mitzvahed in England? That happened to have been my 13th birthday. My mother took uh, my sister and I uh, a year or two before my father took uh, my other sister. They, they couldn't go together because of the business. Were your parents originally from Russia? Originally from Russia, and they were taken out of Russia when they were five or six years old to London by their respective uh, parents. And uh, both of the families settled in, in London. Uh, they came from the same village, they were related. Did you get along with your sisters? Oh, always. And where did you go to high school? I went to uh, one year to manual training high school, and uh, the other years to East Denver High School. And it was a public high school? Uh, pardon? Was it a public high school? Yes, public schools. Did you have a favorite subject? A favorite subject? I don't think so. I wasn't too uh, enthusiastic about studies in those days, I don't think. Did you have any hobbies or interests? Now? No, at that time? At that time, uh, sports in general. Uh, Otherwise, uh, no specific hobbies. What did you want to do when you were in high school? Um, 
I was always going to be a doctor. Uh, that I had been told uh, from the time I was four or five. And uh, that was always my goal. And I think my parents were determined that I not be a tailor. What was that like for you? That was fine. I mean, if, if I think if I'd been told to be a shoemaker, I would have been a shoemaker. I, th I think uh, people need guidance, and I think most people accept guidance, and that happened to have been my guidance. Where did you go to college? I went to the University of Colorado in Boulder, uh, Colorado. I graduated from there, and then I started medical school in Denver. What year was that? That was in uh, 1939 that I began medical school. Did you know what kind of doctor you wanted to be? No, just a doctor. I had no idea of uh, anything further than that. I think my goal was to be able to stay in school because school, uh, I had heard, was very difficult. And uh, luckily, I did stay in school. Do you remember in 1939 hearing about the war beginning? In Europe? Uh, in Europe. Um, not vividly. Uh, I, I think the war was only taken in passing. Uh, I think most of uh, America felt the same way. We w uh, most people went about their business and read the headlines uh, every, uh, every day. Uh, but as far as any impact on me, uh, no impact. Did you know what was happening to Jewish people? Not really. I doubt that, uh, that anybody really knew. I have no recollection of, uh, of, any, uh, and of, of any idea of what was going on or any sense of outrage. So how long were you in medical school before you enlisted? Before I what? Enlisted. Um, I was in medical school for about a year when I applied for a, a reserve commission uh, in the Army. What was your motivation to apply for a reserve commission? Oh, everybody was uh, in the Army or going in the Army or getting commissions, and I desperately wanted to also uh, have a commission. So. Uh, I think it was about February of 41, I, I applied, took my physical at, at Fitzsimmons Hospital, and I was turned down, and uh, I, was, uh, I was tremendously shaken. And I, re I recall calling the colonel of the hospital and asking him, asking him why, and he said, well, you put down a history of hay fever. And um, I said to him that I don't have hay fever now, and it really doesn't bother me and I would like to be commissioned, and he said, well, come on out and take another exam, which I did. But I was 4F. Uh, I passed the uh, physical, which made me very happy. I wanted to be an officer <laughs> in the Army. What was it that appealed to you about being an officer? That was romantic, to be in the Army. And of course, there was discussion of armies all over the world, and I think any, uh, I think probably all young people wanted uh, to be in the army and they had visions of heroics and uh, things such as that. When were you married? Uh, in 41, August uh, of 41. And the name of your wife? Uh, Florence. I was still in medical school, I was a junior. Uh, between my junior and senior years in medical, uh, between my, well, somewhere along in there. Uh, and we got married and moved in in the basement of her folks' home. Where did you meet Florence? I met Florence, I think, at a drive-in restaurant when I was, I think, about 20 or 21. She was about 19 or 18. What's Florence's maiden name? Philippi. 
Could you spell that? P-H-I-L-I-P-P-E. Evidently a French extraction. So how much education had you completed at the time you got commissioned? Uh, I was in my second year of medical school. And I had uh, <clears throat> two more years to go. How long did you wait before you received your basic training? I, I graduated uh, medical school in April of uh, 43, interned till January of 44, and within two or three days of complete, completing my internship, I received orders to report immediately to Camp Barkley, Texas. I didn't even have a uniform. In those days, you had to go out and buy your own uniform. So I hastened to Denver, bought a uniform, said goodbye to every, everyone, and uh, my wife and I went down to, to uh, Abilene, Texas. Let me take you back for a moment. Where did you do your intern? At Fresno County General Hospital in California. That was a nine-month internship rather than a year internship. Everything was being speeded up uh, because of the war. And uh, Was it hard to get an internship? No. Uh, everyone could get an internship. Uh, the choice internships were always harder to get. And choice internships uh, generally uh, were teaching hospitals, uh, general hospitals. And Fresno County was a, a general hospital. Uh, they had all sorts of uh, departments. They even had a leprosy department. Uh, there were quite a few lepers, and they had a TB ward. And I spent nine months there. And was that an exciting time for you? I think so. Uh, there were uh, a dozen other interns and their wives, most of them were married. And it was a social time, and it was a fun time, even if you had to work uh, 24 hours straight at that age, that's no big deal. It was enjoyable. So you were told that you had to apply or to go to basic training on what day? I think I, I think I got the orders January 3rd, and I had to report there January the 6th, something like that. In 1944? Right. And, uh, Were you nervous? No, that was exciting. That was going to be something new and different. Uh, I looked forward to it. At this time, what were you thinking about the war? No thoughts. No thoughts. It was just something that was happening, and uh, I was going to be a part of it, and uh, probably a, l a little excited about the prospect. Did you have any idea how difficult it would be? No, absolutely not. I don't think anybody does. Okay, so tell me about basic training. Basic training uh, involved marching, drilling, uh, various courses uh, such as map reading, which, it, which incidentally I failed. And yet my first action in the bulge was to direct a half track uh, through the mountains of the Ardennes during the bulge. But it really didn't require map reading at that time. You, you sort of played it by ear. And uh, other courses, pure basic training. It was pretty much uh, what the GIs would get, with the exception of some specialized uh, courses. Uh, everyone in my uh, unit were doctors, so it was sort of tailored to uh, doctors. So you had specialized training for doctors? Nothing real special, actually, no. As I recall, uh, Practically nothing medical, as I recall. It was more on being a soldier. And you were just with other medical personnel at that time? Pardon? You were just with other medical personnel? Yes, just with uh, MDs. We had a special group that went through basic training. 
Where did you stay for basic training? My, my wife was there with me. She stayed in the motel. And as I recall, I used to go home uh, maybe on weekends to the motel. Otherwise, I stayed in uh, the barracks. I really don't recall exactly. But uh, she did have a motel, and I know that I visited the motel several times. And you had to buy your uniform? Yes. What kind of uniform? Oh, it was a very fancy officer's uniform. Could you describe it for me? Uh, gray khaki pants and uh, a dark, uh, dark jacket. And um, it was very spiffy. <laughs> to what unit were you assigned to? After leaving uh, Camp Barkley, uh, I was assigned to a general hospital in, uh, in Utah, uh, Bushnell General. It was more of a burn center than anything else. I think uh, people from Africa, I don't recall, but they, uh, a huge number of burn cases. And I stayed there for, uh, I don't know, a month or two, and then was transferred to uh, California. Where was this hospital in Utah? Pardon? Where was the hospital in Utah? In uh, Brigham City, Utah. And we, we rented uh, an upstairs room in a, in a private home. And uh, there was no such thing as a base. I just lived in this private home uh, run by Mormons. And I recall having to my wife and I having to sign a list of things that we would not do, such as invite people in for a bath or play the radio after nine, or uh, have parties or smoke. And we did that for uh, six or eight weeks. Did you, were you able to keep kosher? No, no. I've never uh, kept kosher myself, ever. Were there other Jewish officers at uh, that time? At that time, I don't recall any. Okay, so after Utah, then where did you go? From Utah, I went to, uh, ba uh, to a basic training camp uh, called Camp Roberts in, uh, in California. And uh, this was a huge camp. and. Um, Many, many thousands of uh, basic trainees came through there. I remember one time taking care of a basic trainee by the name of Red Skelton. He, um, I gave him a, a vaccination, a shot. He was standing in line, a hundred or two hundred other uh, uh, trainees, and I gave him the shot, and uh, he fell down on the floor. He fainted. <laughs> So what kind of other duties did you have there? My duties, I um, assisted with uh, quite a bit of surgery uh, at the hospital. And I stayed there for, uh, for perhaps three months or so. And what was three your rank? Months. I was a first lieutenant. And then after there, where uh, did you go? After there, I was transferred uh, in a hurry to Camp Cook, California, where the 11th Armored Division had been in training. And the 11th Armored had been in training now, I think, for three years. And uh, I was transferred there and several other uh, doctors. And um, uh, we drove down there, checked into the camp, and the uh, <clears throat> colonel told my wife that perhaps she'd better go home. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> How did that feel? Not good. She was pregnant at the time. And uh, I stayed there for about... Uh, I think about two weeks or so, and then we all took off. Could you tell me what the 11th Armored Division was? 
It was um, com composed of tank battalions, armored infantry battalions, reconnaissance squadrons, artillery, um, I think 15,000 men, and uh, the very formidable uh, outfit. They were very well trained. And uh, they, uh, they lost half their division the first night. There, uh, we took over, uh, I think it was the 101st Airborne positions one, the, our first night of action. And uh, there was a huge counterattack by the Germans. And this division that had been in training for three years was decimated. 50% uh, of it was gone. All right, let me take you back. Mm. Um, when you went and you first got in the 11th Armored Division, what was it like? You were a new person, a new kid on the block. Um, but I don't have any recollection, uh, really, of what it was like. It was uh, just another assignment. And uh, I recall vividly the train ride from here to Florida up to uh, New York, and it was a, uh, I don't know, four, five, six day train ride, which was supposed to confuse any spies or enemies. And uh, we spent a few days at the uh, uh, point of embarkation in New York, and then we took uh, a ship across the ocean with a convoy with a large convoy and knowing that there were submarines all over, but that wasn't uh, tremendously disturbing. We're going to stop and switch okay. shapes. This is tape two with Dr. Harold Gilman. We were talking that you were coming over to England. Right. What was the name of the carrier? I uh, haven't the vaguest idea. So it, was a, it was a large ship uh, jammed with, uh, with uh, soldiers, and uh, most of them well below uh, the waterline. Uh, but everybody put up with that. What day did you arrive to England? So, sometime in August. I have no idea when. And uh, we were immediately uh, taken to uh, a town of Trowbridge. Uh, and there was a castle on the, uh, on the grounds of this town of Trowbridge. And this is uh, this was our living quarters for the next, uh, I guess, two or three months. And what was your rank at that time? Still uh, first lieutenant. Did you have a commanding officer? Yes. His name? I have no idea. And where were the members of your unit from? That I have no idea. And what were your duties during these? Actually, we had no duties. We were just, we were just all sitting there waiting for orders. And I don't think uh, command knew when the orders were going to come. Uh, we could have gone out in September. The bulge was, the uh, D-Day was already in June. And uh, this is August. This is three months later. But we sat there until the middle of December until we uh, got orders to move. Were there other Jews in your unit? 
I'm sure, but I have no vivid recollection. Do you recall any episodes of anti-Semitism in your unit? In, in the unit? No. Who were your friends at that time? Um, fellow officers. I don't recall them nor their names. Did everyone get along? Oh yes, there was, I don't recall any, uh, any ugly incidents of any sort. Uh, what did you know about the treatment of Jewish or non-Jewish civilians in Europe at that time? I would say close to nothing. I, re I really had no, no perception of uh, what was going on. Um, maybe there was an occasional uh, article or a small article with, uh, with rumors or hearsay or something such as that, but uh, not enough to make any lasting impression uh, on me. Did you ever discuss what was going on in Europe with anyone at that time? Other than the war, no. So what did you do with this castle? What did I do mm -hmm. with my time? Mm -hmm. What did I do with my time? The time went by. I have no idea what I did. Occasionally I went on the pass. I would get on a, a train and go into London. And um, I remember one time in London, the V-bombs going off. But that wasn't particularly frightening because we were sure that one would never hit us. Uh, but as far as other excitement is concerned, just the routine things that, uh, that young people do. I guess we played ball a lot. I guess we had movies. I think we had uh, USO shows of various sorts here and there. Did you correspond with home? Always. I used to send a lot of, uh, of v, v mail. And uh, I would receive some, but it was always uh, very much uh, delayed. But I wrote regularly to my folks and, and to my wife. Did you have to be careful what you wrote? You couldn't divulge where you were or anything that had to do with, with the military. You only could talk about uh, very arcane things. Did anyone read your letters before they came? Pardon? Did anyone read the letters before they were sent? No. In what way? I don't understand. Were the letters censored at all? Oh, uh, yeah. Oh, all the letters. Let's see, in those days. We were told that all letters were censored. Whether, whether they were or not, I don't know, but it was enough to prevent you from saying where you were or what outfit you were with. Um, but we wrote letters nonetheless. <laughs> so in December of 1944, your unit went somewhere. Where did your unit go? Uh, we had orders to uh, go down to the English Channel and board LSTs. And we boarded the LSTs, and I re recall spending a couple of days on LSTs and uh, uh, envying the sailors. I mean, they had such a, a clean existence. And uh, uh, they had beds. We didn't sleep in beds. We slept in on straw bunks in... Uh, in sleeping bags. And we stayed on the LST and finally left and crossed the channel. And uh, the division uh, objective was to go to the subpens at St. Nazaire and police the subpens because the Germans were surrounded after D-Day. Uh, St. Nazaire was surrounded, but St. Nazaire was not captured and they wanted to make sure the Germans didn't break out. So the 11th Armor's job was to police the subpens, which is a very choice kind of a, a job to have because there was practically no fighting there. But instead, as we landed, the uh, bulge broke out. And uh, we were given orders to go up to uh, the bulge, which we did uh, 
driving a whole convoy of tanks and trucks and jeeps. Uh, we drove up there, I think it took a, a day and a night or two days and two nights, I don't know how long. And uh, we uh, got there just in time. And that was, that was, um, let's see, I think the bulge broke out the 16th or something. Like. We got there Christmas Day when everything was chaos. Uh, nobody knew where the Germans were, where the Americans were. Uh, there were stragglers coming out of the woods whenever they saw someone like, uh, uh, like us. And uh, things settled down a little bit, and uh, I was uh, transferred to a clearing company, which is behind the lines. It's two or three miles behind the lines, which is a very wonderful place to be. And uh, I stayed there for a few days, and then I was transferred to uh, an armored infantry battalion. And from then on, we just uh, kept on going uh, uh, east. Were you scared? Pardon? Were you scared? Pardon? Were you scared? Scared? Huh. I think, sure, I was scared, but I was never really frightened. Uh, because I never thought anything could happen to me. If I was if I was in an ambulance and uh, was shelled or strafed, uh, I mean, it was always somewhere else that those bullets were going to go. So I never, I never dwelled on that at all. What were your exact duties when you were in the bulge? My duties? Mm -hmm. I was a battalion surgeon. My aid men would pick up the wounded and bring them to wherever I was, and the other doctor who was with me, we might be 50 yards uh, back in a, uh, in a bombed out farmhouse. And uh, they would bring uh, the wounded, not the dead, and we would give them uh, what amounted to only first aid, and put them on a stretcher and, and, uh, and uh, put them on a jeep and zip out. About how many men were in this unit? Probably had, we probably had, uh, there were two doctors and maybe three or four aid men in the actual uh, unit. And then there were maybe another half a dozen aid men that were actually with, right with the troops. And if one would get hit, well, they would give them first aid and bring them back. Do you remember the other names of the doctors uh, that you worked with? The other doctor that was with me was uh, Dr. Brooks from Chattanooga, uh, Tennessee. Did you hear things from the troops about their encounters in other places in Europe? No, nobody talked about uh, a battle, a fight. I mean, a, Fighting stopped at night, and nobody, uh, nobody would, would discuss what happened uh, during the day. I, I mean, it was sort of old hat. I mean, it's uh, nothing, nothing exciting to anybody. What would you do in the evenings? In the evenings, you'd do the best you could to stay warm. The, the temperatures at this time as a, were 20 below zero. There was two or three feet of snow on the ground. Uh, I was fortunate, being a doctor, I could sleep in the ambulance. I would open the doors and crawl in there. Uh, occasionally I would have to sleep in a foxhole, but everyone else would sleep in a foxhole. And there was no such thing as accommodations. What kind of uniform did you have? Uh, just the ordinary uh, uniform uh, that I had at Camp Barkley. Uh, a little thin uh, jacket, um, regular ordinary leather boots, and uh, maybe a, a, a thin uh, a cap, a knitted uh, knitted cap. And it was 
horrible equipment. Uh, we had as many casualties from frostbite and trench foot as we had from uh, wounds. Uh, I mean, you know, people wake up in the morning after sleeping in a hole and they can't feel their feet and their feet are frozen. Our equipment was, uh, was horrible. Uh, tremendously poor planning, although I guess uh, the Allies never knew that there was going to be a bulge. Did your unit ever take any prisoners? Um, we took, I think, tens of thousands of prisoners, but not during active fighting. How were those prisoners treated? How were they treated? I have no idea. The prisoners, if we would take uh, uh, 100 or 200 prisoners, they were immediately uh, escorted back. But this is when, I mean, they would give up and there's no active fighting. I mean, they would, maybe um, 100 of them would come out of a building with their hands uh, in the air. And uh, they would be escorted back. Was they anything, would get in a line and just walk back. Was anything ever confiscated from them? I have no idea. I never, never had anything to do with the prisoner. Did you have anything to do with any of the civilians? No, not really, other than to talk to them or ask them for bread or eggs or film or uh, whatever. Did you have specific orders regarding how you were to treat civilians? No. Is there any memorable incident that sticks out in your mind during these times? Memorable? Well, uh, everything is memorable. I don't, there's nothing that, uh, nothing that stands out in uh, my mind. Uh, Except seeing uh, civilians come up out of basements and uh, not in terror, but uh, with apprehension, which I think was soon uh, dispelled because I never saw anyone do anything uh, harmful or even treat a, uh, even treat them. Uh, well, I can't say disrespectfully. They were treated disrespectfully, but but. Ne never with any malice. Most of them uh, went about their business. Uh, I think they realized very shortly that they weren't a target of anything. And then after the bulge, where did you go? After the bulge, we um, became the spearhead for the th Third Armored and eventually wound up uh, in Linz. What month was this? This was, uh, I guess, May. May, what year? May of uh, 45. And uh, just outside of Linz was Mauthausen, and we, we took Mauthausen. We actually wound up, wound up in Czechoslovakia and in Linz and that, that whole area around there. And uh, Mauthausen was, I think, 50 or 60 miles away from Linz. And, we liberated uh, Mauthausen. Okay, before we go to you liberating Mauthausen, had you encountered any Jews before that time? None, never. Did you hear any propaganda? Uh, farmers, uh, I remember one farmer showing, pulling out a magazine. This is after there was no fighting and we were lolling around uh, by this farmhouse. And he pulled out a magazine, uh, like Life magazine, with caricatures of Jews and s telling me certain things and pointing to the pictures. And uh, uh, they were universally disliked. And uh, these were very bad uh, caricatures uh, in the magazines that he showed me. How did that feel for you being Jewish? Not good, but uh, wasn't earth shaking. Did you have any specific reactions to this farmer? 
Any what? Specific reactions to the no. farmer? No, he was just a, just a civilian. Okay, the name of the unit that you were with just prior to liberating Mauthausen? The 63rd Armored Infantry Battalion. And at this time, what was your rank? Captain. And? When I was transferred from the clearing company, I went to a tank battalion, and the colonel of the clearing company just told me, he says, you're a captain from now on. Do you remember the name of the colonel? No, I really don't. What point did you realize that the Allies were winning the war? I don't think we ever really uh, thought we were winning the war. Uh, and we, we, we lost a tremendous battle in the Bulge, and then after that we were doing pretty good. The Bulge, incidentally, was, to my mind, a, a defeat of ground forces. And uh, if not for the for air power, it would have been an entirely different story. Uh, mostly we had no idea what was going on. Our losses were severe. None of our tankers wanted to tangle with a, uh, uh, a tiger tank. And uh, only when the skies became filled with airplanes, thousands of airplanes, a thousand anyway, uh, did we uh, break out of the bulge. Before you arrived... So I don't think we ever thought we were winning the war, I mean, winning a battle, maybe. Before you arrived at Mauthausen, were you told about the existence of concentration camps? I don't think I ever knew there was such a thing as a concentration camp. In fact, one of the pictures that I, sent, that I took and I put a label on it, I put, of an of a, uh, inmate, I put down prisoner. He was a prisoner. I didn't know that he was a concentration camp. The inmate or a forced laborer. Um, I had no real conception of what it was that I was looking at. I had no, no idea at all that there was more than one of these. And of course there were, I guess, several dozen. So the military never prepared you for what you might see? No. Military was only concerned with uh, battle uh, deployment tactics and things like that. Where was your unit just prior to your arrival at the camp? Where was my unit? Mm -hmm. I have no idea. I think, it was, I think we were uh, on the edge of uh, Czechoslovakia. And somehow orders, I, I just followed, followed a vehicle in front of me. And somehow we got to, uh, to Mauthausen. Do you remember what day this was? No, I have no idea. No idea. It was late in the war. If the war was over May 7th, this might have been uh, perhaps the end of April or around that time. How did your unit come to be in the vicinity of the concentration camp you liberated? Well, as I say, we were the spearhead. We were the farthest eastward uh, division of the Third Army. And uh, we just happened to, I think we just happened to be there. We bumped into it. We bumped into it on one side and the Russians uh, bumped into it on the other side. How did you know that the name of the camp was called Mauthausen? There must have been a sign. I don't recall specifically. What time of day was it that you arrived at the camp? I have no idea. Had to be, had to be during uh, daylight hours. No, uh, n nothing dramatic ever happened at night. The war seemed to uh, to subside in the evenings, except for artillery. From which direction did you approach the camp? Well, we must have approached them from uh, from the west. And what were and your the Russians from the east? Excuse me. What were your orders at this time? No orders. What did the perimeter of the camp look like? Uh, I remember barbed wire, a huge, a huge camp, uh, blocks and blocks, as I recall, of barbed wire. And I recall a big 
factory on a bluff, well, I think a, the bluff inside the camp, and this is uh, where the uh, inmates uh, worked. And uh, well, what else do I recall? I recall the uh, the ovens and uh, all of the barracks. So when you came into the camp, you came in through the main gate? Yes. How did you physically enter the camp? Was it by foot? No, I, I never was on foot. I had, a, I had a jeep or an ambulance. Peep. What? Armored divisions always called them peeps, not jeeps. Was there any resistance as you came into the no, camp? No, no. Did you see any people outside the camp when you entered? Yes. Outside? Mm -hmm. I don't recall outside, but there were hundreds milling around on the inside, the inmates, and also soldiers, and also Russians. And uh, What was the first thing you saw? The, the first thing that sticks out in my mind is piles of nude dead bodies, huge piles, which I have pictures of that you've seen. And you've seen those pictures on uh, TV also. Uh, I didn't really know uh, why there were huge piles of uh, dead bodies. I don't think I knew anything about gas chambers or, uh, or ovens. I didn't know anything about that. I don't recall how long I was in Mauthausen, probably just the day because our job was to fight, and uh, I think we left uh, shortly. But while I was there, I watched uh, a mock trial conducted by the inmates, supervised by the Russians. I don't know if the Americans had anything to do with it or not, but they took over a room in a barracks and tried the SS guard who couldn't escape. And uh, they put him through some unpleasant exercises such as uh, after the trial, such as uh, carrying doors on their back and uh, um, carrying chairs on their haunches and crawling on the ground. And then I understood, I never witnessed it, that they were uh, executed. Before we go into the trial and what the trial was like. Pardon? Before we go into the trial and and what it was like. What did the people look like when you got into the camp? Uh, the inmates were in uh, striped uniforms and bedraggled and uh, thin and uh, haggard, non-smiling. I don't think they realized what was happening. Were there men and women? You know, I only recall men. I only recall men. About how many? I probably never saw more than a dozen or two dozen at a time, and I, do, I just don't know. How old? I don't think I really uh, paid much attention. As I say, we, I, I had little idea of what was going on. Uh, otherwise, I might have... Uh, I might have paid a lot of attention uh, for posterity, but I didn't know. How old did they appear to be? Most of them were uh, 30s, 40s, 50s maybe. I don't think I saw any old uh, people. The old people were in the piles. Were there any children? No. Did you know they were Jewish? I think I did, uh, but I didn't, th didn't think that they were exclusively Jewish. Um, I really didn't have any idea. They were, they were prisoners, and I just didn't really know what was going on. You, know, you, you don't see newspapers. You don't listen to radios. <laughs> what did the buildings I wonder how many people actually knew what was going on in 43 and 44. 
outside of a, a little blurb in a newspaper here and there, or a rumor. What do the buildings look like? Um, uh, barracks. R long rows of, uh, of barracks. And I never went to the trouble of counting how many rows or how many uh, barracks in a row. What was the design of them? Uh, a triangular roof and just straight uh, sides and, uh, as I recall, they were long. What kind of condition were they in? I don't recall. I don't recall paying much attention. What was the sanitation like? I, I uh, may have no mental note of that. Did you speak with anyone? Um, not really. What language were they speaking? I have no idea. How did they react to you? Not much of a reaction uh, at all. They were just standing around. I think most of them were waiting to see what was going to happen to them. And uh, as I recall, they were just standing around looking. Okay, we're going to change tapes now. Okay. This is tape three with Dr. Harold Gilman. We were talking about what you saw when you got into Mauthausen. I asked you about the sanitation. Did you see any uh, lavatory facilities? No, I wasn't, uh, I wasn't concerned with sanitation. Uh, this was uh, just an episode in, uh, in daily battles, and uh, I think I was only concerned with uh, not having rounds of mortar come in or, or an airplane strafe or uh, who knows what. Uh, sanitation was the least, least thing from my mind. Uh, was there any food? Food? I, I, I have no recall of uh, whether there was or wasn't. How about water? Uh, uh, obviously there wasn't, because I do recall all of the inmates looking terribly malnourished. And if there had been any food, it would have been gone uh, immediately. Does any one inmate particularly stick out in your mind? No, I, I had no connection uh, with, with any of the uh, inmates. You mentioned previously that you did see a gas chamber. Could you describe yes. that for me? That, uh, I think it was two gas chambers side by side, and they were open ovens, uh, a semicircular top and a flat bottom. Uh, there was something in one of them. I have no idea what, and I didn't explore, explore it. And. Uh, I took a picture of it, and I have it labeled an incinerator. And I don't think I ever heard the word oven. But uh, someone must have told me that, that that was an incinerator, and that's what I put on the, uh, on the picture. Do you have any idea what it was being used for? I think I realized then, yes. Was it in its own building? I don't recall, but it was in a, it was in a structure of some sort. Of, but I, I have no recollection. Was it away from most of the barracks? I have no idea. Did you see anything outside of it? Clothes or shoes? No. No, I never witnessed any piles of shoes or eyeglasses or or things such, such as that. The only thing that I was exposed to were, were these large piles of dead bodies, one on top of the other, uh, six or eight feet high. 
and maybe 20 feet uh, long or 30 feet long and uh, six or eight feet wide. And I must have wondered at the time where they all came from all of a sudden, but I didn't explore that wonderment. Did it seem like they had been there for a long time, those bodies? Uh, they weren't rotten. They weren't rotting. Um, while I was there, townspeople were marched in to bury these bodies. Who gather the townspeople? Um, I don't know. Evidently, uh, some of the officers uh, did. Now, whether it was the Americans or whether it was the Russians, I have no idea. But there was a, a big pit, and they were, it was their job to put all the bodies uh, in the pit. And I also have pictures of that. Did you see any torture chambers? No, not that I recognized. Did you ever see the guards' quarters? No. Did you see any animals in pens or stalls? No, there were no animals. Did you see if there was any hospital facilities? Um, no. Did you ask what was going on no. medically? No. As I say, my, my, my duty was to care for uh, injured uh, Americans. And if there were no injured Americans at that, at that time, and there wasn't because there was no fighting right then, uh, I just sort of relaxed, I guess. Did you feel compelled to help any of these inmates? No. Did you speak with any of the camp personnel? No. Did you see any camp officers? No. So you witnessed a act of revenge or retaliation, this trial. Right. Could you describe where the trial was held? It was held in a, uh, in a, uh, a barracks, a barracks room, and it was a room probably as large as this. It was uh, 25 feet long and 15 feet uh, wide, and there was a, a long table, and I recall five or six people <coughs> sitting at the long table, and uh, an SS guard standing there or sitting there, I don't recall, and uh, somebody telling me that this is a mock trial. And uh, then a short while later, uh, I witnessed uh, the things that I described that they were doing to the guards. Who were sitting at the table, the five or six individuals? I have no idea. I have no idea. What were I don't they remember whether it, was, whether it was Russians or Americans or a combination. I think it was mostly inmates who were conducting the trial, but there, but there had to have been some Russians and Americans there also. And how did you know this man was an SS person? Because that's what everybody said. All the other soldiers who were there or officers, uh, and they had uh, recognizable portions of their uniforms on. How many people were observing this trial? When I was there, uh, I recall maybe just a few spectators, three or four, uh, three or four of us who walked into that room. This wasn't a spectacle. This was something that, uh, that they were uh, doing to get even. And uh, I think it must have been very businesslike. What were it you wasn't like an impeachment. <laughs> what were you thinking? Very little. This was not earth-shaking. Uh, as I said a moment ago to you, uh, this was uh, sort of a, a light part of a day because there was no fighting, there was no blood, uh, there were no bombs, not bombs, there was no shelling, there were no worries about landmines, and uh, it was a... Um, A light part of the day, actually.
Did you feel that the trial was unjust? Oh no, I, ha I had uh, I had no feeling such as that. It, if I had any feeling at the time, it was great, <laughs> great going. After seeing the piles of bodies and and the in inmates, uh, the way they looked, I remember them telling me that uh, they were going to be executed, and that didn't uh, that didn't phase me. Were the bodies prepared uh, in a special way for burial when the townspeople came in? No, they just tossed them in. Did a chaplain in an open uh, open pit? Did a chaplain oversee the burial? If there was a chaplain, there may not have been a chaplain anywhere around. Uh, this was a frontline unit that uh, that walked into uh, Mauthausen. And if there was a chaplain, he's got to be uh, he's got to be a mile or two behind. Now, people who came after us probably had sufficient time to uh, look at hospital facilities and sanitation and uh, all things like that. But we were on the move, and uh, I don't remember how much time we spent there. But we wouldn't have spent a lot of time because there was a war going on. Do you remember how the townspeople reacted? No, I don't. All I remember is seeing them there, sober-faced, uh, digging this trench or throwing the bodies in, I, or both, I don't remember. Did any other soldiers react? I'm not uh, aware of any reaction from anyone else. So you took... We really didn't talk about mm -hmm. things like that. And if you, we just didn't talk about things like that. So you took photos of what you saw? Yes. Went and very, very amateurish photos. I mean, th th this is a camera that I picked up from, from some German somewhere or some bombed out house and uh, got some film. And uh, occasionally I'd be able to get my film developed if there was a film store that wasn't uh, blowing up and when, when we took the city and I'd make them develop my roles or I would develop them myself at night if I, if I could get the chemicals from somewhere. Did you take any other artifacts or memorabilia from the camp? I had, I had quite a few things and uh, one I was telling the videographer about was a huge Nazi flag that my wife threw away when we moved here from Denver and I would have liked to have kept that. Um, I had a Nazi rifle, I had uh, some little odds and ends. So what time of day did you leave the camp? I have no idea, and I have no idea where we went. It was just another day, another night, and uh, what direction we went, uh, I have no idea. But we did wind up in uh, in uh, Linz, in Salzburg. I was stationed in Salzburg when the war ended. What was it like when the war ended that Pardon? day? What was that day like when the war ended? Uh, that was a good feeling uh, for a while, and then a rumor spread down that there were that there was a uh, a division hold up at Berchtesgaden, a German division, and that uh, the Eleventh was chosen to uh, to go down there, and that was very disappointing because you, you were alive at that moment, but you didn't know what the next day would bring. But it turned out that that was only a rumor, and the next day. Uh, that was rescinded. And where did you go from there? From there I stayed in, uh, in Salzburg. I stayed in Salzburg for maybe a couple of months and then I got orders to go to Vienna, which didn't upset me at all. And I, I got orders to be a medical officer for a for a company that never ever had a medical officer and I called when I got to Vienna and said, I'm your doctor. And they said, well, we've 
we don't need a doctor, we'll put you on our roster. And I just checked into a hotel and stayed, uh, I don't know, a couple of months in Vienna with the Russians. Did you work at any displaced persons camps? I did. I don't remember where, I don't remember when, but I was a, a sanitation inspector or, or medical officer or whatever, and it was my duties to walk around and look at the kitchen. And I remember seeing huge, great big vats that they would make, I don't know, potatoes or soup or whatever. But I had no idea of what was proper sanitation and what wasn't. And uh, I just sort of spent my day or a portion of the day uh, doing that. And I don't remember what I did, but it, it doesn't stand out in my mind. But it was a uh, DP camp, and it was loaded with unfortunate people who, who looked like they were unfortunate people. Did you talk to any of them? No. Did you know they were Jewish? Uh, I probably, I probably did, but they were all kinds. At that time, a displaced person was just almost anybody who didn't have a home, and uh, it could be anybody. How were they accommodated? In this sort of, as I recall, it was just an open camp. I don't remember whether it was, t it must have been tents, but uh, very sparse accommodations. It was, they were camping out is what, what it amounted to. Did you see children at these camps? See what? Children. No, I don't recall. If I did, it doesn't stand out in my mind. Do you know how life was structured in these camps? I have no idea. Did you know if people were trying to contact their families at these camps? No. I had no, no connection uh, with the uh, people in the camp uh, whatsoever. So when Maybe it was the language. I, I, they, they spoke a dozen different languages and uh, I couldn't understand them, they couldn't understand me. When did you return home? I left uh, uh, France in January of uh, 46. So you went from Vienna to France? Right. What were you doing in France? Uh, Vienna straight to Le Havre, which is the harbor. Got on a boat and I was assigned as a ship surgeon to a uh, A small boat took 19 days to get from uh, France to uh, New York. And I was the, uh, the only doctor on board, and I was seasick. <laughs> we took the northern route, and it was bad in January. Did but I got to New York, and then I came back to Denver. Mm -hmm. And uh, I saw my daughter, who was, uh, what, 15 months old. And, uh, and her name? Roberta Bobby, she calls herself. And she was born while you were gone? Yes, uh-huh. And, and how many other children did you have? I have two others. I have a, a son that was born uh, uh, four years later and another one uh, six years later. And that year, those years? Uh, 51, and, uh, wait, I take that back, 47 and 51, a little over a year after I came home. And Bobby was born what year? She was born in 44. She was born during the Battle of the Bugs, and uh, I remember sitting in an open field, laying in an open field, hiding, uh, uh, behind my ambulance while I was being shelled. And we'd, and we'd just gotten a, a pile of letters. That was probably the first time in maybe three weeks that mail caught up to us. And I remember reading this pile of letters and one of them uh, said, it was a telegram actually from my wife saying that a child was born. And I didn't know whether it was a boy or a girl. And 
I remember with my uh, laying uh, at the tire of the ambulance with my head buried into it while I was reading this letter. I said, if I ever get out of this, I'll never complain again. And then what kind of work did you do when you came back? When I came back, I established a, uh, a practice which is extremely difficult to do. I couldn't find an office. Everything was rented. Um, I finally found an office, but I couldn't buy a car. And I tried for, I think, seven months to buy a car. And then these are the days when everyone wanted a car and everything was rationed. And uh, I put money under the table with a couple of car agencies and didn't get a car. And here I am practicing medicine, or trying to practice medicine without a car. And finally, out of disgust, I wrote a letter to General Motors, Chevrolet Division, and said, uh, I'm a decorated war hero and I can't buy a car and I'm a doctor and I can't get to the hospital, I can't do anything. And within a week, I got a, uh, <coughs> a letter back from Chevrolet Division telling me to go to any dealer of my choice uh, and pick up a car, which I did. I paid all the grand sum of, uh, I got a Chevrolet, it was beautiful. I think it was uh, $800. <laughs> and then I practiced medicine uh, until, in Denver until 1985, um, till the end of 85 and retired and came here. What kind of doctor were you? Family practice. Did you ever get in touch with your unit after the war or any buddies? Um, many years ago, I went to uh, uh, Chattanooga and saw Dr. Brooks. He was my uh, uh, co-doctor at the bed. He was the, the battalion surgeon. I was the, assist the assistant battalion surgeon. And there's no more menial job for a doctor in all the services than assistant battalion surgeon because you're you're with the troops and uh, but that's what I was and I visited him and uh, I've never corresponded with him since did you he, talk about he's probably not around he was older than I he had just come back from the Aleutians he had a tour of duty in the Aleutians uh, I think in 41 and 42 or 42 and 43 and immediately got assigned to the 11th Armored. Do you he know spent a lot of time in the military. Sorry. Do you know any survivors today? Any? Holocaust survivors today? No, I have met, met a few, but I'm not intimate with uh, any. From what you saw being a Jew at Mauthausen, did it change your belief? Um, no, it, it just reinforced my, uh, my disgust with everything that I found out afterwards about the Holocaust. I never heard of the Holocaust uh, in, in 44 and 45. As I said before, I, I think none of us really knew the extent of what was going on. And perhaps even the Germans didn't. Uh, I think I'm willing to give them uh, that type of a, of a credit. They knew something was going on, but they really didn't know exactly what was going on. What would you say to a Holocaust denier today? What would I say to who? A Holocaust denier. A Holocaust denial, it's uh, totally uh, ridiculous and we should pay no attention to uh, crackpots. What would you say? I think, I think the more you dispute a, uh, a crackpot, uh, the more it is in their favor. It draws attention to their beliefs. And if somebody says that the sun does not come up, come up in the morning and it's not the sun, I think to, do, to dispute them uh, is a disservice. What would you say to future generations? I don't think anything you say to future generations uh, does very much good. There's been 
there's been hundreds and thousands of atrocities for the last thousands of years and each generation cannot uh, cannot fully appreciate what went on before them and uh, they're living a unique existence and they of course as you and I uh, did we they know it all and uh, I don't think you can uh, I don't think you can tell them anything that really changes their behavior. Uh, I think it's hard to change uh, human behavior. We've always been warlike. I think we'll always be warlike. Is there anything we haven't spoken about that you'd like to tell me about your experience during World War II? Mm, I think we've covered everything uh, pretty much. There's nothing that uh, that stands out in my mind. Uh, on a lighter tone, uh, a very exciting time was uh, being with the Russians in Vienna. They were paid in Allied occupation money, and we were paid in Allied occupation money. The Russians could not send money home. We could send money home. And the Russians were paid according to how many soldiers had been in that unit. And whether they had died or not, the money was sent down to that unit. And the Russians were walking around with, with uh, a thousand shilling notes, that's the Austrian money, uh, maybe six inches thick. And that was good money. And uh, all of the forward GIs uh, had a uh, good time selling them a bottle of uh, bottle of wine for a hundred dollars. Now a hundred dollars in 1945 is equal to maybe two thousand dollars today. And there was a, a, hu a huge trade in uh, in goods. You sell them a necktie, you sell them a K ration, you sell them a watch, and this money could be mailed home. And I did mail a, a fair amount of money home until August of that year when the U.S. government said you can't mail home any more than you draw in salary, on a lighter note. But I sent home a few thousand dollars and some of the GIs who were really into it big must have sent home hundreds of thousands of dollars, particularly if they had access to <coughs> depots of uh, supplies, on a lighter note. <laughs> And where are you spiritually today? Pardon? Where are you spiritually today? Spiritually, I, uh, I worship, not uh, as much as I should. I don't go on uh, Friday nights or Saturdays uh, to temple, although we used to go fairly often in Denver. Here I don't belong to a synagogue. I, I, uh, we go to Stephen S. Weiss in, uh, in Encino, in Los Angeles, in the, in the valley, uh, for the high holidays. But spiritually, uh, not too active. So we're going to bring out your wife. Oh, okay, shall I get her? Okay. This is tape four with Dr. Harold Gilman. Before you introduce the beautiful woman right. sitting next to you, I wanted to ask you why you decided that you wanted to share your story and give a testimony to us today. I, I thought it might be of some value uh, for posterity. And I, I think I had a little bit of a story to tell and I, I feel better having told it. Could you introduce this woman next to you? This happens to be my uh, beautiful wife, Florence. <laughs> We've been married uh, 57 years. How was it for you being in America and your husband being far away? It was pretty sad. I was pregnant 
and uh, I, when I had my first child, I sent a telegram to him that he received like six weeks later, sitting next to a tank with bombs bursting around him. He didn't see her until she was two years old. Um, it w wasn't easy, but you know, we survived. Were you scared that he was Jewish and knowing kind of what was going on over there? Not really. I, I don't think that we were aware of that fact as much that he was just a soldier in the war. And how has it shaped your lives? Well, my husband always said that he would never, ever, ever complain about anything ever again. And he didn't, and he hasn't. I uh, really didn't change my life, my life right now at all. But it was, um, it was hard when he was gone. I had a child, and I remember once he sent a telegram to me. Uh, I was living with my parents. He sent a telegram, and when we opened the door, there was a messenger, and of course we thought the worst. And all it was was just a telegram telling me that he had received the news of the birth of his daughter. I sent you a telegram? Mm-hmm. Yeah, <laughs> it was pretty scary when, they, when we answered the door and there was a messenger there. But it was a good message, not a bad one. Well, I want to thank you so much for sharing your story with us today. Well, I'm it glad to have done it. It was truly a pleasure. Thank you. You're welcome. Dr. Gelman, could you tell me who this is a picture of, please? Yes, the top picture uh, are, is a picture of my parents on their wedding day. This is taken in London, and this was taken about um, 1901 or two or three or somewhere uh, along in there. Uh, my the father at that time was, I think, 21, or maybe my mother was 19. This picture on the left. Yeah, just Hold on. Are we okay? Okay. Could you tell me the name of the parents? Yes. Uh, my mother's name was Rachel. My father's uh, was Julius. You don't hardly hear those kind of names anymore. Uh, this picture, the picture below on the left. Okay, wait. We're going to do... Can you tell me who these people the, the, are? The, the picture on the left is of my mother's parents. Uh, that picture was taken in... Uh, in London. Uh, they both were brought over to America by my father uh, several years after he brought my mother over. I have no idea of their age at the time. Uh, my grandmother incidentally lived to be uh, 93. My grandfather passed away quite a few years before that. The picture on the right. Okay. And the name of them? The name of your? Uh, Leah is my grandmother's name. And uh, my grandfather's first name, I don't know. And the last name? Winterman. Okay. Dr. Gilman, who is this picture? Yes, uh, this picture is taken of my father seated. He must have been uh, 13 or 14 years old next to his father. His mother is right behind him. And uh, he has a brother on the right and uh, a sister uh, on the other side. And the name of your aunt and uncle? Uh, the, uh, Leah is the, the lady, and uh, um, how the name escapes me. I think it was Harry, I'm not sure. I never met, I never saw my grandfather. I did see my grandmother that's in the picture when I went to uh, uh, London when I was 13. She, all, she lived uh, also uh, well into her 90s. Can you please tell me what this picture is? Yes. Uh, this picture uh, depicts five generations. Uh, the older lady is my uh, grandmother, my father's mother. Next to her is her son. Next to him is his daughter, and on the other side is another generation, and finally the little baby is the fifth 
generation. And who is the baby? And this was all taken in, uh, in London. The year, I have no idea. And the name of the baby? I have no idea who that might be. Okay. Dr. Gilman, can you tell me who these people yeah. are? Uh, this is a picture of my parents. I think they were in their mid-60s, perhaps, at this time, or early 60s. Uh, my mother, Rachel, and my father, Julius. And where was the picture This taken? was taken in Denver. Can you tell me what this picture Yes, this is a picture taken at uh, my basic training uh, in 1944 in, uh, at Camp Barkley, Texas. I have a full field pack on. I evidently I've just returned from a 16-mile a march or some long march. I have no idea who the other uh, soldiers are that are with me. Which one are you? Are you the one in the middle? I'm, I'm the one on the uh, extreme left with the backpack. Can you tell me what this picture is? Uh, this picture is a picture of uh, a castle in Trowbridge, Trowbridge, England. And this was my uh, living quarters for uh, several weeks, along with uh, several hundred other soldiers. Uh, it wasn't quite as luxurious as the exterior uh, is we slept uh, in wooden two or three tier bunks on straw in uh, in sleeping bags but it was much better than anything we had in europe this is 1944. and why is the corner cut out and the i mailed this picture home to my wife and we couldn't divulge uh, our location so i cut out uh, the part that says trowbridge Dr. Gilman, what picture is this? Uh, this is a photo of uh, Captain Brooks, who was my co-worker uh, in the battalion aid station, and our jeep somewhere in, uh, somewhere in Germany uh, during battle. Uh, at this particular moment, there obviously is no fighting going on, but this is our mode of transportation. It was either in uh, a command uh, peep like this, or it would be... Uh, in one of our two or three ambulances that always accompanied us. And what year? This is 1944, somewhere in Germany. Dr. Gilman, can you tell me about this picture? Um, the picture on the, on the extreme right is uh, of a gallows, and uh, in the distance uh, is electrified uh, barbed wire fence and a guard tower. These are taken at Mauthausen concentration camp in, uh, in Mauthausen, Austria in uh, uh, around the, the end of April 1944. We had just liberated this camp and uh, April 1945? Uh, of 1945 I mean. Uh, directly above uh, the gallows is, is a photo of, a, uh, of an inmate, very haggard. This picture is of a rather dejected looking uh, prisoner in Mauthausen sitting uh, isolated from uh, anyone else. What, what the circumstances uh, were around this picture, I don't recall, but I took that. Can you tell me what this picture is? Uh, that seems to be a picture of uh, of the prisoners in, in Mauthausen concentration camp. Uh, they're all nude. I think they are waiting to be showered and probably deloused, or at least showered. And this again was taken at the same time uh, in uh, 1945 at Mauthausen. And you took the picture? Pardon? And did you take the picture? Yes, I've take, I took all these pictures. Dr. Gelman, can you tell me what this yeah. picture is? This is a picture I, I took of the incinerators at Mauthausen Concentration Camp. Um, I don't know that I uh, appreciated fully the significance of it, but I must have in order to have taken the picture. In the year? This is uh, also the same time. This is uh, uh, 
1945, uh, late April. Dr. Gilman, can you tell me what this picture is? Yes. Uh, this is a picture of a mock trial of the uh, SS uh, German guards uh, conducted by the inmates primarily, but with the help of uh, the Russians, perhaps with the uh, Americans. Uh, these guards were being tried evidently for atrocities perpetrated on the inmates. And uh, my understanding was that uh, they would be uh, convicted and executed. Who took the picture? Pardon? Who took the picture? I took this picture uh, inside of a barracks where, where the trial, mock trial, was held. And the year? Uh, May of, uh, late April of 45. Can you tell me what this picture is? Yes. This is a picture of SS guard, SS guards who have been convicted by uh, the moot court being made to crawl on the dirt ground until they were exhausted. And uh, they're surrounded by many onlookers. Uh, they could be either inmates or Russians. Uh, these guards were uh, made to exhaust themselves, either by doing what they were doing right here or by carrying heavy doors on their back, back and forth, walking back and forth until exhausted, or by carrying chairs in their outstretched arms while on their haunches walking uh, with their knees bent. Uh, my understanding is that uh, they were executed after this. And who took the picture? Pardon? Who took the picture? I took this picture. And when was the picture taken? This was uh, late April uh, 1945. Okay. Dr. Gilman, what picture is this? Yes. This is a picture in the Mauthausen concentration camp in April of 1945. It shows uh, a deep pit being dug by townspeople and bodies, the bodies do not show up too well, but, but a, a pile of uh, bodies of uh, prisoners that are going to be deposited in, in this deep pit by, by townspeople who were made by, by the Allies to, uh, to do this chore. In the background are some uh, uh, barracks that house the, the prisoners and some American soldiers with uh, crosses on their helmet. Okay. This is a picture? This is a picture of uh, a trench being dug by local townspeople who were made to dig it to deposit uh, a huge pile of bodies that we saw when we first entered Mauthausen concentration camp in April, uh, late April of uh, 1945. These, pe these uh, individuals were forced to come to the concentration camp and do this dirty work of uh, digging the trench and depositing the bodies in it. Okay. This is a picture uh, taken in Mauthausen concentration camp in late April of 19... Uh, 45, and seated on a bench in total exhaustion is an SS guard who has been uh, uh, put through uh, s some activities that are, that are not, not pleasant. And um, his, his fate after this uh, uh, was not uh, pleasant either. This is a picture of me and uh, three Russians taken in November 1945 in Vienna. Uh, I was stationed there for two or three months and became friendly uh, with the Russian soldiers and uh, here I'm posing with three of them and I think somebody is using my camera to take this photo. What is this picture of, Dr. Gilman? Uh, this is a picture uh, 
taken immediately after the war ended. Uh, it's of the a portion of the Eagle's Nest, which is perched uh, atop a very high mountain uh, in Salzburg. And uh, it was a, um, uh, a sightseeing spot for the soldiers who were uh, immediately around uh, Berchtesgarden area. Uh, this is a picture also of uh, the Eagle's Nest area, and this, as I recall, was a, uh, uh, a barracks uh, for soldiers. Now, it's all burned out or bombed out. I don't know what happened. Perhaps they torched it uh, uh, when they left, which had to be in a hurry, or maybe it was uh, strafed and bombed uh, by the Allies. And you took this picture? This picture I did take. You're going to start on the left. Uh, on the left, that's my, my son, Bruce, with his daughter, Jessica, in front of him, his wife uh, standing uh, next to him. Uh, next to her is uh, Peter, my son-in-law, with his daughter, Carrie, and uh, uh, his son, uh, Darren, and Brett in front of uh, his wife, uh, my daughter, uh, Roberta, and little Matthew in the front, uh, smiling, my wife and myself. And when was this picture When taken? was this picture taken? This picture, uh, this picture had to be taken uh, 18 years ago, roughly. About 18 years ago. S 17, 18 years ago. or less. Okay. Uh, this, this is a picture of uh, my daughter and son-in-law's three children uh, at the graduation of uh, their oldest son, no, their younger son from the University of Wisconsin in 1995. Uh, my wife, myself, Carrie, my granddaughter, Brett, Darren, Peter, my son-in-law, and Bobby, my uh, daughter. Okay. 